Hello, everyone. So this is part three, the final part of this lecture series on uh, using an unstructured mesh and the simple algorithm for solving the Navier-Stokes equation. As I mentioned uh, in the past two lectures, please watch these two sets of lectures first before uh, watching this video. And also, of course, look at parts one and two of this lecture series. So if you recall, uh, in part one, what we did was we actually talked about solution of the momentum equation. And then in part two, we talked about solution of the pressure correction equation and how to calculate phase velocities using uh, the pressure weighted interpolation method or the so-called Richau interpolation scheme. So today, what we're going to talk about is uh, essentially correcting the velocity and pressure. Well, the pressure is pretty straightforward. The velocity, both cell center and base velocities. And then we will also look at some results. This is what we had from the previous lecture. These are our expressions for the cell center velocities. Um, this is where we had applied the divergence theorem to actually come up with this expression. The only difference between calculating pressure sources for the momentum equation and this expression is that here we are using pressure corrections. Uh, likewise, we derived expressions last time for the cell phase velocities. However, I mentioned also that we don't really need to calculate the cell phase velocities. What we really need to calculate are basically the velocity dotted with the surface normal because we really need to calculate correction of the mass flux because the mass flux is what goes into the links for the momentum equation. Now, how do we do that? Well, this is our expression for the mass flux correction. Notice that here we are simply using a velocity correction rather than a velocity. That's all that is. And so here we have u velocity correction times nx plus v velocity correction times ny. And then once we plug in the expressions from the previous slide, which are these two, um, these two at the bottom, okay, you get these expressions. Notice that what we end up getting is a dp dx times nx. This is a typo here. This should be dp dy times ny. And that is nothing but the gradient of the pressure correction times the unit vector on the face, surface normal at the face. And we also noted that that can be represented by the pressure corrections, the difference in the pressure corrections between the two cell centers divided by this delta plus some tangential terms, which we neglected and being consistent with what we did, did for the pressure correction equation, we are going to use, we are also going to throw away the tangential terms here. And that gives us then an approximate expression for the mass flux correction. Note that again, in the outer loop, these mass flux corrections go to zero by definition. And therefore, whether or not we keep these tangential terms or not, doesn't really affect the final answer. All it affects is the path towards convergence. So those are our final expressions. The question is, how do we code them in? Okay, and this is where I'll show you some code here. All right, so this is where we are actually calculating the velocity corrections. So first thing we are doing is we are calling this routine where we calculate the values of pressure correction at the faces. It, it is actually a replica of the subroutine that we use for calculating pressure at faces from cell center pressures, uh, pretty much identical. So once we get the pressure corrections at the faces, we can then use that in our formula, which is essentially this formula right here. That's what we are executing, okay? And the corresponding code looks like this. So we are taking the pressure correction at the face times the surface normal. And of course, this SN sign flips it to point outwards. And then here is the area. So we sum over all the faces of, this, of the um, cell, and that's what gives us our velocity correction. And later on, we multiply it by a negative sign and divide by the diagonal of the momentum link coefficient. So that then gives us our velocity corrections, u, u and v. 
And then this is where we are converting from U hat to U double hat, okay? And to do that, what we have to do is we have to relax the velocity field. So we take the correction, multiply it by the uh, damping factor or the relaxation factor in the outer loop to get from U hat to U double hat. Similar thing we do for the mass flux correction. And this is where we are using this expression here. So we have this quantity within square brackets. In my code, I'm calling this coef, a coefficient. So this is nothing, as you can see, this is distance weighted interpolation of volume over A naught. And then finally, we multiply that by the density, the difference between the cell center pressures, pressure corrections rather, divided by the delta times the area. Okay. So that's that. And likewise, just like we relaxed the cell center velocities, we also relax the cell phase velocities. This is where we are using relax the same relaxation factor for the um, mass flux. Okay, mass flux is relaxation of the mass flux is the same as relaxation of velocities because it's a linear relationship. So that's what we are using here. So that con kind of concludes the entire algorithm, all the pieces, if we go back here. So that was the last piece, okay? So once we have done that, then we are back to square one. We have corrected the M dots right there, okay? And that M dot is then used again to calculate the link coefficients of the momentum equation in the next outer iteration, okay? Which sort of completes the full circle. All right, that being said, let's go back now to a few tips for our coding, okay? So this is something I tell all my students. It is very important you make sure, because this is a segregated solver, right? We solve the X momentum, Y momentum, and then the pressure correction. You have to make sure that those individual solvers work. What that means is they should converge essentially to machine accuracy if you let them run. And for this particular problem, because you are doing an unstructured mesh formulation, you should make sure that that happens without skewness first. In other words, you are testing a case where the skew sources should come out to be zero. In fact, you can check that. You can print out the skew sources. So suppose I, instead of a rhombus, I have a square cavity, okay? The skew sources should come out zero and you can test for that. You can print them out and ch check to see that they are zero. And first make sure that all your solvers are working for this Cartesian mesh case, even though it's an unstructured formulation, okay? If that works, then try the grid with skewness. In other words, the rhombus in this particular case, okay? If, that, if these steps don't work, in other words, if your individual solvers don't work, don't even try outer loop convergence. It's never going to work. So that is an important step. So to demonstrate that, let me just show you a case. So what I've done here is I've set my momentum iterations to 100,000, really large number, okay? And I've set a tolerance of 10 to the power minus six, six orders of magnitude convergence. And I want to make sure that my momentum equation converges. Now, the other thing is checking the sanity of the solution. So when you are starting off, your initial velocities, let's say, are all zero, okay? Except at the boundaries. Boundary, you have a U-lid at the top boundary. Everywhere else, velocities are zero. And your pressure has been initially guessed to zero, it's it, let's say. So what that means is the problem that you're solving right off the bat is actually a diffusion problem. Okay, because your advective links are all zero. And in that case, if you solve the problem on a square cavity, you should get the solution for a diffusion equation, which is kind of like a steady state heat conduction equation or a Laplace equation with just U equal to one at the top boundary and zeros everywhere else. So I'll just show you, um, you know, what happens when you run that case. So if I run this case and hopefully you can, the font on my screen is big enough. But what you see here, if I run this, is this is the convergence of my X momentum equation. Of course, it took a large number of iterations to get to six orders of magnitude convergence, but that doesn't really matter. What I really want to look at now is how does my solution look like, okay? And 
if I load my solution, by the way, here is what the mesh looks like. Uh, pardon the screen resolution. It should look smooth. It kind of looks, you know, a bit weird. But if I look at my um, U velocity, as you can see, it's a nice diffusion profile. This is the solution of a Laplace equation with basically U equal to 0 0.1 at the top surface, which is the lid velocity, and zero everywhere everywhere else, okay? This is the solution you should get if the momentum equation goes to full convergence. And it is important to test that, okay? I can do the same test also for a skewed mesh. So suppose this test passes and you have been able to do that, you should also do that for a skewed mesh, okay? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually change the angle of my rhombus I'm going to change the angle of my rhombus from pi over 2 to pi over 3. Okay. And I'm quickly going to rebuild my code and run it. And once again, you see this is how it converges. Again, it takes a large number of iterations to converge. Okay. But at the end of the day, I should now be able to look at my solution again. And it looks like this. Again, you see a nice diffusion profile. This is basically the solution of the Laplace equation on a rhombus with u equal to 0 0.01 on the top surface and zero everywhere else. So these are the kinds of tests I'm talking about. If you do not pass these tests in the process of building up your full code, you will find that at the end of the day, the code is not converging, no matter how hard you try, how much you change the relaxation factors and so on. Okay, sometimes you may get lucky and it may converge for a very coarse mesh, but for a fine mesh, it's not going to converge. Okay, the same thing you can do for the pressure correction equation. For the pressure correction equation, let's say you have solved the X momentum equation and the Y momentum equation. Of course, the first time you solve the Y momentum equation, you're going to get a zero. Okay, but you have an X momentum equation solution like this. This will obviously create a mass imbalance. Okay, now that mass imbalance is the source term for your pressure correction equation and your pressure correction equation should also converge to machine accuracy and you should get some pressure correction that looks sort of meaningful. Okay, now it is difficult to say what is actually meaningful. One of the things you need to understand is that Wherever you have a mass surplus, the pressure should rise. And wherever you have a mass deficit, the pressure should go down. So at least those kinds of qualitative checks you should be able to do, even though you're not able to do a quantitative check of how much the pressure should rise or decrease, okay? Those basic trends should be followed when you solve the pressure correction equation. All right, so with that, being said, with these tips out of the way, let's look at our solutions a little bit. Okay, so again, just to refresh our mind, this is the problem we are solving. It's the driven cavity problem with an 80 by 80 mesh. Those are the results I'm going to show you. Okay, and the Reynolds numbers we are considering are 100 and 1000. These are the relaxation factors we use. So this is the damping factor for the momentum. In the outer loop, when we correct the velocities, this is what we apply, 0.8 times U prime, okay, to get from U hat to U double hat. Likewise, to get from PK to PK plus one, we simply do pressure correction times 0.15, okay. Now, I should mention that I actually tried 0.2 and 0.2 did not work for me in this case. And that is partly or probably because the of that assumption we made where we threw away the tangential terms in the pressure correction equation, okay? So we it needs more relaxation because of that. Uh, it works fine for this uh, square cavity, but it doesn't did not work for the rhombus with 0.2. And then alpha is the inertial damping factor. We are using a pretty small number here, 0.1. And then for momentum sweeps with Gauss-Seidel, I'm doing 10 sweeps and for pressure correction, I'm doing 100 sweeps. As you know from our discussion of the simple algorithm, typically 
uh, mass conservation should be much tighter than momentum conservation. And so it is customary to use larger number of iterations for the pressure correction equation, which is what we are doing here. So here are some of the results. So this is the what the solution looks like, stream traces for the lower Reynolds number, Reynolds number of 100. Uh, there is a tiny little recirculation zone here, which you can refine, uh, you know, if you use a, or which you can resolve if you use a really fine mesh. And they become much more prominent as you go to the higher Reynolds numbers. So you see two distinct recirculation zones. The one on the right corner is slightly bigger. Here is what the convergence looks like. Um, if you recall with the uh, staggered mesh, I think we had we had something close to 500 iterations, and that's about what we get for a collocated mesh with an unstructured formulation. Uh, and then for Reynolds number of 1000, it takes slightly more number of iterations, um, as you may expect. So that's the square cavity. If I look at the pressure fields, this is what it looks like. So notice that here we are getting a pressure difference of about, so this is about 0 0.25, 0 0.15 kind of, so about 0.4 Pascal. Uh, for the larger Reynolds numbers, this is about seven Pascal, okay? Obviously this number is going to go up as I go to higher Reynolds numbers, okay? Uh, that's to be expected, but just keep these numbers, in your head, 0.4 and 7, okay? Now, when I go to the rhombus, this is what the flow pattern looks like. Obviously, now you have a distinct recirculation zone in this far corner, even at Reynolds number of 100. And then at 1000, you have this interesting uh, double vortex here. And there is a lot of discussion in the literature as to as what Reynolds number you sort of uh, you know, gets some sort of transition between the two vortices and so on, you can look it up. And this these results look very similar to what's reported in the literature. And this is what the pressure looks like. And this is where what we discussed earlier comes into play. Notice that here also the pressure difference is, is of the order 0.4. And here the pressure difference is also of the order of about seven, okay, for a higher Reynolds numbers. If I look at convergence plots, this is where we start seeing some differences for Reynolds number of 100, which is viscous dominated, obviously. Um, the convergence is pretty similar to the square cavity, but for Reynolds numbers of 1000, it took significantly longer. It is not 100% clear to me why that is the case. Obviously, this is a very nonlinear problem and convergence is often uh, unpredictable, uh, but it does take significantly more number of iterations compared to the 100 case in the case of the rhombus than for in this case of the square cavity. So with that, I'll conclude. Hopefully you can take all this information and start developing your own code. Um, good luck to you and thank you for your attention.